It's, we'll be looking at Luke 12, 35 through 59 this morning. And as we look at these scriptures, what we are doing, we started back in 2016 after the first year of preaching on things in the Bible to do with nature. We started by uh, looking at all the red letter words in the Bible, the words that Jesus spoke. And we started it when he was 12 years old and chronologically we're going through his life and the words he has spoke. So we're in our 75th message and still got a long ways to go with the words of Jesus because we need to hear what he says to us today. And let's go to the Lord in prayer first. Father, we love you. And thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to come out in this beautiful tabernacle, Lord, you prepared for us, Lord, and for those that are here to be part of this time as we are obedient to that which you've called us to do. And we pray, Lord, that you are glorified, Lord, in all things that is said and done today, and that you bless those who come and participate. And may you be honored, Lord, as this even goes out through the Internet, through the YouTube, through the Facebook, through the website, wherever you take it, Lord. Uh, we just pray that those that you have to be touched will be touched and you will be glorified. For it's in the holy name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you. Again, as we're going through the words of Jesus, we come to chapter 11. Now, we're in chapter 12, but I want to go back to chapter 11 and let you know what's taking place in his life. Jesus has been walking. He's been teaching. And in chapter 11, there was a certain Pharisee, which was a religious leader of that time, invited him to come into his house and dine with him. And he came into his house, and the Pharisee got upset because Jesus did not uh, do the proper washing of his hands before he ate dinner. He didn't do uh, just as he thought he should. So he asked him about that, and as he did ask him about that, Jesus proclaimed six woes upon the Pharisees, the scribes, and the lawyers at that time in Luke 11:53. We need to read that because it's the last part of Luke 11. And it said, as he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things, laying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something he might say that they might accuse him. So uh, apparently after what he said, the woes he put on the Pharisees and the scribes and the lawyers at that time really got him upset. And things just really began to erupt because when you come in chapter 12 of Luke, it says in verse 1, in the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together, so they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And if you was with us several weeks back now, because we took a break from this for the Passion Week and for Resurrection Sunday, and as we come back to this, we, we've already looked at that first warning. Jesus began right there in chapter 12 after giving six woes to the Pharisees and the scribes and the lawyers. In chapter 12, he begins to give five warnings to his disciples, to us that are followers of him. And the first warning, as we looked at many weeks ago, was beware of hypocrisy or the leaven of the Pharisees. In other words, false religion, pretending to be something you're not. And then the second warning we looked at was found in Luke 12, 13 through 14, beware of covetousness, which is lusting after things that other people have. And then the third one we looked at just before Passion Week was beware of wary. You see, in Luke 12, 22 through 34, he talks about that because if we are worried about today and concerned about things, it will stunt our spiritual growth and rob us of joy in our spiritual life as we walk with the Lord. And today we want to look at the fourth, which is beware of carelessness. You see, in Luke 12, 35 through 53, as we begin to read these verses, Jesus shifts from the emphasis of from being worried about the present to being watchful about the future. There's a difference, you see. We've got to be watchful. You see, the themes of Luke 12 all go together. The best way to conquer hypocrisy, which was the first warning, the best way to conquer covetousness is the second one, and the best way to conquer the wary, the third warning he put out, is to look for the Lord's return. 
If we look for the real Lord's return, those four or three will not be part of our life because when you are living for the in the future tense that our Lord is coming back, it's hard for the things of the world to begin to ensnare us, to cripple us and hold us back. So, uh, so let's read this scripture now as he begins to talk about this in Luke 12, 35. He says, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. That means be ready. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they will be, may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. And if he should come in the second watch or even the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Now, he uh, begins to talk about the second coming of the Lord, and as he's talking about that, he refers to it as a wedding. A Jewish wedding during that time would actually take place at night. So, and the groom would take after the wedding it's ever what time it took place at night it actually couldn't take place to the father uh, uh the bride said it could take place and then as it took place the bride the groom would take his bride home but the servants of the groom was supposed to have everything prepared and ready and it, as we watched a lot of the tv shows about kings and princesses and things you always see the servants standing at the door when they ride up they've got to be there the whole crew's got to be there. Everything's got to be ready. So they were to be ready when the groom brought his new bride home. They were to prepare. So the, sober, the servants had to be sure. Everything, even them, they had to make sure they were ready, that they had their tucks on and their shirts were pressed and everything, their shoes were shined when the, the groom would come home with his new bride. So they would stay busy getting everything prepared, including themselves, um, so that they would be at the door when he drove up with the new bride, I rode up. So because when he comes, it would be like a, a thief in the night. We don't know when a thief's coming. They didn't know when this uh, groom was coming. As we don't know the day and the hour in which the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back, we can read signs. We're going to talk about that next week. But we don't know. So if there's actually a day that sometime in your life that, you know, there's so many things going on, you say, no, I'm sure God's not coming, Jesus is not coming back today. Beware. <laughs> he could, like a thief of the night. When we least expect him, watch out. You see, there is something, uh, if those that's been with us a while, I normally say at the end of the message, but I want to go ahead and share it now as we're thinking about the second coming. The way we should live and what he is telling us is, as Adrian Rogers said many times, live as if Christ died yesterday, arose this morning, and he's coming back tomorrow. Actually, we should live as though he's coming back today, but you get the ideal of that, that because if we live as though he died yesterday and he arose this morning, as we talked about last couple of weeks with Passion Week and Resurrection Sunday, there's excitement in the air knowing our Lord lives, but there is actually should be more excitement in our life that that we, yes, we know he's sitting at the right hand of the Father making intercessions for us, but someday he's coming back. He's coming back for his bride. He's coming to take us home to be with him. Of course, some of us can actually, uh, the Bible says to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. So we also know that's referring to when we quit breathing and the soul takes on a new life spec with him. We are with him. So that day is also an important day. It's just as important as the day that we're looking for him. We're all hoping uh, that we would be part of that rapture and we would get to be part of that and see Christ come in the sky. But you know, we may not. We may be a lot, a lot before us that we will see him that day because of our relationship with him, that we know we are born again, that when we breathe our life's breath in this life and we say we fall asleep, that we wake up in glory with him. So we want to live our life every day, even if that's the way we're going to see him, with that excitement every day 
that day, this may be the day I quit breathing. I don't know. This may be the day the Lord comes. Either way, it's going to be awesome. Going to be awesome. A lot of people will say, well, I'll say, how you doing today? And they'll say, well, I'm on this side of the ground. And I stopped one the other day when he said that. And I said, well, you know, the other side of the ground, if you're born again, Christian's not so bad. He said, okay. But, uh. And uh, he, he, and he, he, I think this man proclaimed to be a Christian, and he, uh, he said, but, I said, because the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He said, okay, so I'm not in the ground. Either way, I said, that's right, your body's there, but to be present with the Lord. That's the excitement. That's what we live for. That is why we can, and we have that hope, we have that peace, that our life does not end in the grave, but we have eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we also learn as we continue to read the scripture here that Peter was one of those with an inquiry mind. He, he in verse t uh, 41, in Luke 12 there, as we stopped reading, he said, Then Peter said to him, Lord, do you speak with this parable only to us or to all people? So Peter wants to know now, Lord, is this something that you just have for us disciples that are following you? Or do you want us to share it with everybody, that everybody knows what you're saying? And uh, Jesus, again, he doesn't always answer the questions directly. He tries to get Peter and us to even think about things. So he provokes his thought with a question and then with a proclamation. The question is found in verse 42, and the Lord said, Who then is a faithful and wise servant? whom his master when will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season. What kind of servant would a master prefer, people? What kind of servant would a pastor, uh, a servant prefer? One that is faithful and wise? Is this one? He said, the Lord said, who then is a faithful and wise servant? Who the master wants to make ruler over everything, you know, over and trust him. So uh, we know a master would preserve, so rather have a servant that loves and his job, loves him, and it is about the work. Or actually, I could say, would he prefer one that just tries to get by, just to do the little things as little as he can to get the job done to say that he stays out of trouble? We know that. But Jesus answers that actually in the next verse. In verse 43, he said, Blessed is the servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to, he begins to beat the male and the female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him, and an hour when he is not aware, and he will cut him into uh, and appoint him a portion with the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall not shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving stripes shall be beaten with few. For every one to whom much is given, from him much will be required, and to him much has been committed. Of him they will ask the more. Again, we need to look at the scriptures. There's a lot of different thoughts comes out of these particular scriptures. But look at what he actually said, not what he did not say. First of all, he did not say the unfaithful servant would lost his salvation or his place. He would lost his rewards. Because he has brought shame, he has brought disgrace on his master, and he should expect chastisement, even in this life, for the deeds in which he's done. And he did not say, we, we work for our salvation. We work where the Lord is looking just like you would if you were a master and had slaves or employees. That's good to say employees if you want to. Um, you're looking for people who will do a good job, who honor you and your, what you are trying to establish, your brand or what, how it be. So the Lord and the master, he's looking for somebody who enjoys what they do and who enjoys serving, who loves him and actually feels like they owe him their best. And that is what the Lord is asking us to do. He also realizes, though, that in the line of servants, there are always, our employees, you've got some that 
are placed over others. Not everybody's equal in the line. So you have a servant or so that lead other servants. So if a leader servant leads the others wrong, shame on him. He's guilty of great chastisement and correction. Now, if the followers following the leader follows him down the wrong path, he is still guilty because each one of us must stand accountable for our actions, right? So even though one's leading wrong, you need to be aware of what your, your leaders, the religious leaders in the world and all around us, where are they leading? Are they leading properly? Because we will each stand accountable for our own, but it will be fair judgment because those who know and are in authority will be chastised more for going the wrong path and leading others wrong than those who were followers and followed wrong even though they could have and should have searched out the truth. But he said the judgment when you're standing before God will be fair. There is no excuse for being, uh, not being faithful in this life because it is as we serve our Lord in this life and influence others for him that we lay up our treasures in heaven that we lay at his feet one day when we stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ. And that's what we want to do. We, we want to love and appreciate what he did, that he left glory. He came down, placed himself in the virgin. He lived 33 and a half years sinless, so that he could go to the cross and take our sins upon him, that we might obtain his righteousness, that we one day can stand before him. And as we live this life, as his servants, we want to be obedient so that one day we can receive rewards, not chastisement, and lay them at his feet and say, thank you, Lord, for loving me so much and, and caring for me so much. But we get in danger sometimes. Warren Wiersbe shared that once a believer starts to think his master's not coming back, I mean, hey, it's been uh, over 2,000 years. You know, he's not coming back. Things are in dismay and everything's out of order. His life begins to deteriorate. So once the believer starts thinking the master's not coming, his life, he says, begins to deteriorate. Our relationship with others depends on our relationship with the Lord. So if we stop looking for him and we stop loving his people, the motive for Christian life and service must be a desire to please the Lord and be found faithful at his return. That's what he's talking about. Don't be, beware of being careless. Just get involved in everything, but forgetting the reason we are here, that we're pilgrims and strangers traveling through this land and that our greater home is eternally with him. And we are to be preparing ready, excited for that day which could come at any time. It could come when we breathe our last breath, or it could come if he splits the eastern sky and he welcomes us home. So, now, the Lord didn't stop there as he was talking about the warning of being careless. Notice in verse 49, he says, I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. This is Jesus speaking. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on the earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For from now on, five and a house will be divided. Three against two, two against three. Father will be divided against the son, son against the father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Uh-oh. Jesus said this. I, I, I thought the religious leaders of our day said Jesus came to do bring peace. And he all about peace and love and hope and charity and all that kind of good stuff. You know, that's Jesus, so we don't worry about him. We can live like we want to and go to church on Sunday and look good because he's going to love us anyway. He's all about love and peace. But Jesus just said something opposite of that, didn't he? He came to send fire and baptism and a vision. Now, Dr. Luke did say in Luke 2.14... 
Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Yes, that is true. But Jesus knows as he is talking here that as we wait, as we watch, as we work and we get busy in this world, it's not going to be easy. Life in this world, especially without Christ, is not easy. But with Christ, it is not easy either. You see? Because we are aliens in this world. This is not home. This is enemy territory we're in here. Satan is the prince in the power of the air. So Jesus spoke of fire, which is a symbol of judgment, which his coming into the world did bring judgment. John 9, 39 through 41 tells us that. And then he spoke of baptism, which is a symbol of suffering. Fire is a symbol of judgment. Baptism is a symbol of suffering. The apostles experienced suffering for their witness. So will we. Christ went to the cross as the children of Israel went through the, the, the river. That was baptism. That was suffering. They had left that all stuff they were comfortable in, and now they are suffering. But they come out victoriously on the other side. Christ went to the cross. He suffered the stripes upon the cross. He suffered there. But he comes out victorious. Today we will come out victorious. Uh, next Saturday or so, we're going to baptize Miss Nancy here. And it's a, a symbol that she has died to herself. That's suffering and being buried and then resurrected as a new person in Christ. It's a symbol. It's a showing forth of something that has taken place inside her. So that's what he's talking about, the fire of judgment, the baptism of suffering. And then he talks about division. Jesus does give peace. He gives peace to those who trust him, those who love him. He brings peace. Romans 5 and 1 tells us that. But you see, our confession of faith can become a declaration of war among our family and friends. Because when we be declare that we are followers of Christ, that means we are following his word and we're going to live by the, that which he has directed us to. Uh, that's what it should mean. And our family who does not want to live by those standards and they think this is okay, this sin is okay, this little thing is okay, we're just going to go along with the world and make everybody feel good and not offend nobody. That means as we walk with the Lord, they become our enemies, right? Or they're going to consider us their enemies. We don't consider them our enemies. We consider them an opportunity to bring them to Christ, to find that joy and peace. But they don't see that. So Jesus is the cause of division. So we need to keep on working for our Lord because we love him. Not because we have to, because we desire. We're looking for his. And he said, beware of carelessness. Now, as we look for his coming, as I try to close here this morning, I heard the late Ray, Adrian Rogers the other day on the radio as I was going to Tallahassee. Um, and he said he had heard this story. And he said that this particular family had received word that a long lost son or a, long, a son that had been gone astray and hadn't talk, come home, hadn't talked to nobody for a long time, long, long time, had sent word he was coming home. So someone heard the family arguing when they should actually have been rejoicing. Here's this lost long son coming home. And they were arguing. And someone asked, well, why are you arguing at this point when you should be rejoicing? To which they answered they were arguing how he was coming. The dad said he was coming by car. The brother said he was coming by plane. The sister said he was coming by train. And the mother had said he was bringing somebody with him. And they were all arguing about that. In the process of arguing, there was a knock on the door. It was a son. They were not prepared to welcome him. Waiting for the Lord to come. We need to be prepared. We need to continue working for our Lord. Stay in his word. Let his word direct us and guide us. And not be arguing about little things. But come together in his name. You see, even if there's not peace on the earth, there is peace in heaven. 
Luke 19.38 says, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. I hope and pray that when he returns or he calls you out of this life, to, I hope you're watching and you're waiting and you're working and you have that relationship that you, to be absent from this body means to be present with the Lord with you. Because if it's not, the destination otherwise is hell. But he gave us this opportunity to be here today that we have this breath that we have to live, to make decisions, to learn, to grow. And that's why, as his servant, I want to do my best to lead people as a, in the right direction. Because I will stand before him for that which I have led others to do. And which way to follow. So, And I hope today that you have that relationship. And in a moment, we're going to close in prayer, though. If you haven't got that relationship, I'll, I'll pray that you will pray and ask the Lord to come in your heart and, and save you. And if you do, I would love for you to share with us after the time that we can rejoice with you and help you content to start your growth with the Lord. If you're watching us on YouTube, on uh, Facebook, or any place on the Internet, the website, please... There's contact information there. Contact us so we can rejoice with you and what the Lord has done in your life. And if you have that relationship, it should be an exciting day. As I can go back to when I was 12 years old in downtown Chicago in a little mission that the Lord spoke to my heart. And it changed my life. And you need to share that. And all the things, I said, if you've been around me long, you know I've got a lot of testimonies. Share with others what God is doing in your life, that they can rejoice with you. Share with us. We love to rejoice with you. But just before we close, let me share this with you for those who may not have that relationship. Because this is the first part of beginning that relationship. The Bible teaches us in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. So we know sin brings death, but God gives eternal life. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all are sinners. That means we're all sinners. Because you're born in America don't mean you're not a sinner. You know, are you, your parents might have went to church. Does not mean you're not a sinner. We all are sinners. We all must come to that point that we realize that we are sinners, but we are offered eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we, we come to that in Romans 5, 8, he says, but God demonstrated his love toward us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So how do we get that eternal life? Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For the heart, with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made in salvation. For the scripture said, whosoever believes in him will not be put to shame. For whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I pray that you have listened and God has spoke to you. And today, if you don't know him, that this will be the day that you come to know him as your personal Lord and Savior. And if you are walking with him, I pray that we've encouraged you. Maybe we all, we all, every day to get so busy doing things and involved in things that we get lose focus of the real purpose of life. Preparing for the groom to come. So I pray you've been encouraged today. Proverbs 16.3 says, commit your work to the Lord as your thoughts will be established. So commit your work to him and he will help us keep focused on that which he is doing. And again, thank you for being helping us be obedient. Y'all have come to us this morning here in the park and joined us in this service. And thank you. We pray God's blessings upon you. Would you pray with us? Father, we thank you for this privilege. We thank you for the opportunity again. Thank you for the gift of your Son, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and the gift of your Word. Jesus, thank you for going to the cross for our sins. Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence. Please go with us and take this as you would. And may you be honored. For it's in the holy name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.